Welcome to the 11 a.m. Pacific showing of the last minute e-commerce holiday prep. Today we're going to talk through um, what's new with Google, some of the ways that Google is looking at this holiday season, some of the things they're seeing, and then some of the new uh, ad types and opportunities you will have this holiday season through Google. Uh, so I'll walk through some of those. And then we're going to touch on some last minute Google strategies that you'll be able to uh, take out of this and hopefully execute within your brand and um, some of the things that you'll want to also prepare for as you look into the next uh, year and next holiday season. Um, hopefully we'll finish with some questions. Uh, we do have, I do have a lot of content and um, um, I'll be going through quite a few things and so we have to make sure that um, uh, we have time hopefully to be able to answer some questions. And um, um, we do have some people with issues with uh, audio on this. Um, let me check on our end. I'm without my some of our marketing team because we're pulled in multiple different directions today. So I'm also monitor or monitoring the event as well as I'm the moderator as well as the presenter, which is unique. Um, so let me see if I can stop and reshow and get audio to work. Um, okay. So looks like not everybody has trouble with audio, so it could be some. So uh, those that can't hear audio, can't see, uh, can't hear what I'm saying. And <laughs> so um, I'll try to respond um, to make sure that everybody dials in directly uh, to the phone portion of it. And I will. Okay. Um, so we have a tremendous amount of uh, content. And I will talk fast, and but we will put a recording up. And at the end of this presentation, you will also get an opportunity to have some time with me one on one. Um, again, a lot of these things are going to be complex and time consuming on some of them to execute. And so some of it uh, are going to be very specific questions and answers to for you and your business. And so uh, take advantage of that hour that I've set aside for each one of the uh, brands been invited by Big Commerce that's on the calls with me today. Um, I love talking business um, and I love the opportunity to help businesses be more responsible online and make more money. So <clears throat> I am uh, Ryan Garrell in the Enterprise Strategist Logical Position. Um, a little about me, I am uh, <clears throat> father of a rapidly growing family. Uh, my wife and I uh, she's obviously the one that brings looks to the family. We're expanding our fourth kid at the end of December. And so uh, we are busy. Uh, we live on a farm outside of Portland, Oregon, and we have five businesses. Uh, a couple of them are e-commerce. So as a family, we have quite a lot going on. So, But it's, business is just fun for me. Um, I was CEO of a company that Logical Position purchased a couple of years ago that focused mainly on e-commerce. And so we came together under the banner of Logical Position. Uh, two years ago, we had about, uh, I think, about 70, 75 e-commerce and large complex enterprise clients that the team I brought over from TQE handled. And now we are up to 1,300 just in two years. Uh, and so we are, we've been growing rapidly. And uh, it's been a fun, crazy process. Uh, but hopefully a lot of that uh, experience that I've uh, learned, I can hopefully provide to some of you over the uh, over this webinar and then hopefully on a uh, audit if it makes sense for your company or just to have some time spent and ask questions about e-commerce, uh, whatever I can do to help. Logical Position is uh, one of the Google Premier Partners. There's a few, there's probably five, six hundred of those in the U.S. Um, so it's not as exclusive. What is a little bit different is that Logical Position is a uh, was one of the first 30 Premier Partners. And we're actually a, considered a channel partner, which is I think there's only five of those. And it gives us a level of resource that's pretty unique. Um, it's been fun to be able to see what we can bring to our clients and the things that within Google's pool of resources we can provide. Uh, in fact, our Google rep was one of the first 400 employees. He was hired directly by Sheryl Sandberg. And so that does give us a lot of access to 
unique things within Google that maybe not everybody can get. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you ever have an opportunity to take advantage, call me and figure out if I can help you get into betas or fun things within Google. Um, I love helping. We have, uh, I think, 330 employees now. We have seven offices around the country with Denver opening uh, in just, I think, two and a half weeks with our first group of employees. So um, it's been fun. We're one of the best places to work in the country, according to Inc. and uh, Oregon Live, which is a local publication here. The only thing that matters for you or for our clients is that we don't lose employees, so we get a lot of consistent strategy, uh, consistent account managers that don't turn over, uh, change clients. So that's just a benefit to our clients, really. Google has lots of holiday insights and information. And the way they're talking through holiday this year um, is making sure that retailers of all size understand what large brands have been executing for a while. And that is, if you have a retail storefront, you have less traffic this <laughs> now than you did a few years ago. But the visits that do happen are much more engaged. And so if you are one of those big commerce clients that has a uh, storefront as well as online, you've seen this. Um, and that three times increased value of each store visit is largely because of the research that people are doing. And Google's message over the last six months has really been foot traffic is changing to finger traffic. And so that's the verbiage they're using in talking about traffic now. It's online. It's basically on mobile devices. And so you can see this is a person in San Francisco. As they moved through the city during the day, where was their foot traffic? And how was it? It could have been a ride to work, a ride home. They're looking for bike rentals at 3.45 p.m., skate rentals at 4.32. They're comparing Frisbees at 5.15. Uh, this person is probably single, doesn't have five kids, so they get to do all these <laughs> outdoor things. Uh, but again, all of this research happening on their phone, and it's it, it's a great thing uh, for advertisers and online businesses, but it's also a very frustrating thing because the path to conversion looks more like this. And so a few years ago, we had very linear paths to purchase where we were able to see, hey, they started here and they converted here, and we saw all the touch points in between, and it was glorious as marketers. And now we have all of these twists, turns, changes, storefronts, tablets, mobile, desktop, um, changing devices. It's it's crazy. And as I look at analytics more and see all of these complex paths and a lot of them that we can't see in analytics just because of the changing devices, um, just means we have to be aware and cognizant of these changes and understand that small changes in how we're spending money on mobile or advertising on mobile can have an impact in the conversion path dramatically without knowing. And so I see this a lot when I'm looking at brands, uh, accounts online or helping audit uh, their paid search, we'll see that uh, they're bidding down on mobile dramatically because the return on ad spend was not there. And so they're not seeing the conversions or the, or the, uh, the revenue coming from these, these clicks. But if this is you as an advertiser and this is your path to conversion from this woman, and you have, you can see on the bottom, there are four touch points that were mobile devices. If you're bidding down on mobile because you're not seeing in return, if you take out one, two, three, maybe four of those touch points on mobile, you might lose this conversion. And while mobile doesn't actually have an impact or show up in analytics, maybe, it's going to, it's going to impact and draw things down elsewhere. And we've seen this a lot. We've done a lot of tests with very large brands that have the budgets to be able to test very creative things. And we've seen, hey, as we push harder in mobile, uh, we see a rise in desktop conversions. We see a rise in foot traffic to their stores. Um, and when we pull back, we've seen a direct correlation to that, those channels going down. So it's, it's going to be worth testing for you and making sure that you're tracking data correctly to see that. And I'm going to touch on how we can do some of that and still do it even at this point in the holiday season. Um, so with no single path of purchase, you're going to have to understand that um, online to offline is a big play for a lot of brands. Um, some brands, if retailers sell your product, you advertising as the brand will have an impact on foot traffic to your retailers and how successful you are selling through your retailers. I have a lot of brands that compete with their retailers online, but they also invest in branding dollars online on paid search on what I would consider non-brand terms, knowing that some of those conversions are going to happen at a retailer and not on the brand's website or in the brand's stores if you have those. Uh, so, again, all of this from Google is just high-level things. Most of us conceptually know it and understand it. The key is, is believing it and then taking that belief 
and translating into how am I looking at analytics and what's the filter I'm processing a lot of my data through? How am I trying to create a source of truth around a lot of those touch points that allow me to grow my business? Because I'm assuming that's what most of you want to do. Um, this holiday season, um, <clears throat> Google's been pushing out a number of 2.29 trillion in e-commerce sales. So this number uh, comes from uh, a lot of studies that were done on how much money is being spent online. And this is the 2017 number. And 2018, I believe it will be $2.4 trillion. And so it's continuing to grow. Obviously, there's tons of money being spent, not surprising anyone. But what is surprising is how much it's growing and what we're doing with it. It's growing at four times the rate of store re in-store retail. And now it's still a small piece, but 10% of all retail spend happens online. That number actually surprises me because I think with my Amazon app on my phone, uh, probably 40% of my household sales are done, on, are done online. We actually order our groceries online through a local retailer here and go pick them up. And so I would somewhat consider our groceries even being purchased 100% online. Um, people are spending lots of time online. No news to any one of you. Um, but Google did some phenomenal studies to come up with a lot of these. Um, Two-thirds of the time, that middle number there, 65% of transactions start on mobile. And so if, you're, if your company hasn't been spending on mobile or hasn't tested it to see how it works or impacts your organic traffic, impacts your email success rate, impacts your direct traffic, you need to be doing some of those tests. I would put an asterisk by that and say, I don't necessarily think holiday would be the best time for you to be testing that. But if you've already done some of the tests, you might have the data already available to you that would show that you could push harder on mobile during the holiday season. Um, there's also some, some things going on that Google's trying to address within their shopping platform. Um, it's the expectations of consumers online. They've been changing and evolving constantly, and I think uh, Google obviously helps us get a lot of our data and slides and helps with a lot of the clients, but I actually believe Amazon is having a bigger impact in how people purchase right now than Google is. Uh, some people might debate that, but I believe that Amazon is having a, a direct impact on what people expect from e-commerce sites and how they perform and what and, and how they can change devices. So in my household, my wife and I each have an Amazon app on our phone. We all have, I think we have five tablets and we have multiple computers and just our family of my wife and I and our little kids. Um, but I can go in and add something on my phone to the cart. I can pick it up uh, on my computer and it's in my cart. My wife can add something to the cart from all these devices. And I'm coming to expect that from e-commerce sites as well. Like, can I put it in the, in the cart on my phone and pick that up on, on a desktop and, and do that? So. Understand that's what people's expectations are, and so if your site is not up to that par or doing that yet, you want to find ways that you can be doing that, <coughs> if for no other reason that people come to expect that. Um, so some of the things that Google has this holiday season that you may not have seen before. Always exciting to see what Google is doing. If you've not seen these yet, um, they're called Shoppable True View Ads. And the uh, video ads you can see on YouTube, and so the ones you can skip before you see the cat video that your mom sent you um, or the thing, funny thing that your college buddy sent over to you. Um, you can see the ad on the top right is from Sephora. Sephora has a very large advertising team, very complex. They do some great work. Um, you'll see in that ad, that ad below that has the products they're talking about. You can click on that ad and it actually goes directly to the website to convert. This has been around for a while in a beta it's now coming out to everybody though. So anybody can put clickable ads on TrueView. If your brand has not looked at advertising on YouTube, I highly recommend it. It is definitely something you can do right now before holiday season. It's not gonna impact negatively some of the things in AdWords you already have going. You can use YouTube for remarketing. You can use YouTube for in-market segments, which we're gonna touch on. Um, it's cheap. I'm a huge fan of it. And if you don't have any content on YouTube yet, there's a program called the YouTube Director's Cut that is from Google, allows you as a website, business owner, brand to create a YouTube video very easily, edit it up, put text overlays on it, 
um, it's very, very simple. Um, and the crazy thing is I was at the release of this, uh, I think, two months ago. And Google's on stage talking about how amazing their app is, the YouTube Director's Cut. And it's actually only available on iPhones, um, not on an Android device. So you have to have somebody in the company with an iPhone to do it. But it's extremely easy. Highly recommend at least looking at it. Um, YouTube, if somebody skips the video, um, after five seconds, you have the button that says you can skip. If they skip the video, you as the advertiser pay nothing. And so within the first five seconds, you want to make sure you have something calling out your brand, somebody that knows who you are, and then calls to action throughout the video. If they watch 30 seconds, you get charged. And it's only a 10 cent view charge uh, on average. So it's fairly inexpensive, but can do some great things. So look at that. And then overlay, because I draw big commerce, I assume you're on uh, uh, e-commerce, you're selling things, use the overlay for Choppable TrueView. Also, this actually came out in alpha last holiday season, and now most retailers have the opportunity to get it. It's the uh, showcase ads. So what you're seeing now at the top of search results primarily on, uh, I'm seeing it more often on desktop than I am on mobile. This example is obviously mobile. But as you search a general term like summer dresses, which is not probably a good holiday term for most of you, but you can see the brands, uh, Macy's, Nordstrom, ASOS, and you actually can scroll through their inventory of summer dresses before clicking on one. And as an advertiser on this, you actually don't pay until they click to your website. And so this piece and all this interaction that they're having with ASOS, as you see this example, is actually free for ASOS until they actually click through to the website. So I love it. Uh, it the key on this is going to be clean feeds going into Google. Um, Big Commerce does fairly well with feeds, so that's why we're a big fan of them. I think we have about 300, 250 or 300 clients on Big Commerce. Um, but at the end of the day, this is why this is still not readily accessible and an automatic thing that people can just push a button in AdWords and get it to work is because Google's worried about the uh, customer experience and making sure that the right products are showing. So um, if you have an agency, talk to them about that. If you don't, again, we can bring this up on an audit where I can walk through it with you and how it might make sense for your brand. Uh, the last cool piece um, is in in-market audiences for search. So in-market segments have been available for YouTube and display for a while. Um, the one that's been most applicable to me recently uh, was in-market segment for cars. So my wife and I uh, bought a Mercedes last year, and Google knew that we were going to buy a Mercedes before my wife knew that we were going to buy a car, just because of the research I was doing. So I was an in-market for Mercedes. And none of the dealers in Portland actually took advantage of it. So I actually reached out to a couple of the marketing directors there and said, hey, this is something that you're not using, you might want to. But there are over 500 in-market segments you can choose from and layer that over your search and shopping data. And so if there's segments for your product specifically already in Google, you can utilize that out of the box. It's phenomenally powerful. Um, or you can create custom affinity audiences. So you can build your customer online and bid on them different if they seem to be in your uh, ready to buy your products or services um, very very great it's, it gets a little more complex but it's a layer you can add on to what you already have no matter what state your AdWords account is you can add this bid layer on there and you can even test it and see how they respond before you bid more aggressively on it so that's why I love how Google set this up is you can get some pretty creepy insights uh, from these people searching on Google and then see if they're performing different and then only when you see them performing better will you bid more aggressive on them or bid down on them. Um, and the last little nugget Google's releasing this holiday season is view through conversions for search and shopping. So if people just see your ad, there is an impact, but previously we didn't have an opportunity to actually see what that impact was. So if somebody saw your product in shopping but didn't click on it, did that have any impact? at all whatsoever. We didn't know. We, I had, we had some ideas that maybe it did. So now you'll start being able to see that through view through conversions on a uh, adding that column in AdWords. So just add that column. You'll start seeing data differently. Um, you're going to want enough data to decide if it's really having an impact or not. So you know you see one or two sales doesn't necessarily mean you need to be bidding more aggressively in shopping or search in that campaign or ad group. But it just says, hey, there's some likelihood here that your ads are having an impact even if they're not clicking. And those, those views are free for you, so that's even better. All right, so now getting into uh, the actual specific things you can be doing this holiday season at this point. Um, 
what can you do? Um, in shopping, your holiday's already started. Um, I'm going to show you a graph a little later that shows that impressions and search volume starts increasing around Halloween for holiday. Um, and so if you've already missed that piece, right now you're a week away from Thanksgiving, which is where the real chaos starts. So I'm not going to advocate for any of you to make any major changes at this exact moment. If you're not holiday dependent, and this is more of a slow season for you, holiday season doesn't matter. You can make some big changes, but specifically talking to retailers on this call that, hey, you make a lot of money during holiday. It's a big time. I'm going to tell you don't upset the apple cart at this point. But there are some things you can do within it um, that, we'll go, that I'll go through that um, can hopefully help. I've done, I don't know, hundreds of talks on e-commerce over the years. And a question I get asked regularly, especially when it comes to shopping, is what should I be spending? You know, how much budget should I have out there? And my answer always is it depends, and that always makes people mad <laughs> because uh, even though it's true, they all, they all want a number. And so since we work with so many companies, we have a large set of data uh, that most agencies don't have access to. So I can tell you with some level of confidence a range that you should be looking at. And so how much should you be spending? If you're a brand with wholesalers, so a great example of this would be uh, fossil watches. They, they manufacture and sell direct to consumer. They also have retailers like Nordstrom, Macy's, JCPenney that they compete with online over their same products. If you're a brand like that, um, you will spend about 50% of your search budget on shopping. So for every $100 you spend on search or text ads, you spend about $50 on shopping. Generally speaking, it's going to be different for every company, but people force me to give them numbers, and that's the number I'm going to put out there. If you're a retailer, that wouldn't be considered a brand. Nordstrom would be a retailer considered a brand. There's a lot of search volume just around Nordstrom. But if you're Bob's Bike Shop in Topeka, Kansas, and outside of a 15-mile radius, there's not a lot of people searching for you, you would be considered a retailer. You're selling bikes that a lot of other retailers sell as well. You're probably going to be spending two to 400% of your search budget in shopping. So for every $100 you spend in search, you can reasonably expect to spend between two and $400 on shopping. And then as you spend more, the same ratio should stay in play. Uh, what should you expect as far as return on ad spend? Also a very uh, dangerous question, uh, but that there are some guidelines to put in place. If you are a brand, the return on ad spend in shopping as a whole should be higher than your search non-trademark or non-brand. Um, if your account is not set up, separated by trademark and non-trademark, or brand, non-brand, you have some pretty significant issues within your account, and definitely take the time to sit down with me and we can organize how that should look and why it should look that way. Uh, but retailers, brands, I don't care who you are, you should have a brand campaign or a non -brand and, and non-brand campaigns. Um, label them what makes sense if you use trademark or brand in your, internally within your company. Uh, but the return ad spend is going to be higher in shopping than it is search non-TM. And as a retailer, it's going to basically fall in line. So if you get a 2x on search non-trademark, so if you're Bob, if people are just looking for a pink bike, that is going to be the same in shopping as it is on text ads. When they modify that and say Bob's Bike Shop, you know, new bike seat, that's going to have a higher return on ad spend. And so you'll want to look at that differently. The simplest thing that almost every company misses in Google that can be done right now, regardless of where you're at in your holiday season, is connect your Google properties to each other. Google Analytics, Google AdWords, and Google Search Console. They're the big three of Google. Um, if you're spending money in AdWords, you've probably connected analytics to it. Um, there is some complications that need to, that come into play if you are a, uh, a company that has multiple analytics properties and you pull AdWords into all of them, there can be some complications there that you need to know how to move uh, cost data and AdWords around, and I can, I can give you some insights to that. Search Console is the one I would say almost 99% of companies don't do, and it has the most value to an advertiser. Um, a few years ago, if you've been in, in digital uh, long enough, you realize and you got frustrated at Google when they took away the search queries and analytics for your organic traffic. You have a lot of not provided. In fact, almost all your traffic is not provided. You don't know what they're searching for when they come to your site. Connecting Search Console to AdWords 
actually gives you those queries. Google has them, they just don't necessarily provide them anymore. <laughs> but connecting Search Console to AdWords is very simple. Just go into Settings within AdWords, Linked Accounts. You can send an email to the email on your Search Console. It says, hey, you want to connect to AdWords, click yes to do it. It used to be called Webmaster Tools. Anybody with a website has one. Um, you might not have access. You'll have to dig that up possibly. Hugely valuable. What you'll be able to see is the click-through rate for each query on both organic and paid search or when there's no paid search and just organic and the average position that your ad is in. So phenomenal amounts of value. Uh, we had to spend a lot of time in this about five years ago when we started working with the Dallas Cowboys because a certain uh, owner, Jerry Jones, um, did not like paid search. In fact, his belief was firmly that it stole from organic. And um, he's the Dallas Cowboys, one of the most powerful brands in the world, and a billionaire, so it was difficult uh, arguing with him, so we had, to pull, we had to have some good data. So Search Console was hugely valuable in that. And we were actually able to show with the Dallas Cowboys, ranked number one for most of their terms organically, when they didn't have paid search in the same, in, on the same search as their number one organic ranking, they lost 8% of their traffic and revenue. And so having them together actually boosted everything for the organization. And so that is the case for almost every brand, not just the Cowboys. Um, and Search Console is one of the biggest things to be able to show that. Frustrating thing with Console is it doesn't pull, and when you connect it with AdWords, it doesn't pull historical data. It only moves forward. So uh, get it on there as soon as possible. It's a, in the Dimensions tab under Paid versus Organic. It's a wonderful report that's hidden in AdWords that is not highlighted enough but it's hugely valuable. Uh, highly recommend that. The other thing you can do very quickly uh, before holidays really kick into high gear is get your conversion tracking working. This is, again, a huge problem I see across so many organizations, and it's not terribly difficult to fix. It just does require somebody that actually knows how to fix it. Uh, if you're into Google Analytics um, and you're on this call, you're a probably a retailer, and you need to be tracking e-commerce. If you don't have revenue tracking and analytics, get that done as quick as possible. And ideally, you've connected AdWords and analytics. You don't want to be bringing your analytics goals into AdWords. And I'm kind of talking about a perfect world scenario here. For some companies, that's not possible. They've got to use analytics goals in AdWords for various reasons. Uh, but most of you are on big commerce, or should be, and it should be possible. And many of you uh, get excited when somebody with a Google email address, reaches out and tells them they want, tells you they want to help you manage your AdWords account. Um, Google email addresses are a frustration to many in the industry because they have a lot of credibility, and who doesn't want to get you know attention from Google? The problem is uh, Google employees don't always have your interest at heart, and they don't always have the most experience in AdWords. In fact, most people, if you're spending less than ten thousand a month in AdWords, the people within Google that you're speaking to have probably been with Google less than a year. And they don't necessarily understand the platform as well as they could. So they're advocating for a lot of people to use smart goals. Don't do it. Most of you are in e-commerce, and it doesn't matter if somebody is spending a lot of time on your site or viewing certain pages. Um, you want them to check out and send you money. That's your goal in e-commerce. And com people that don't do that aren't as valuable, and you don't want those conversions to be ported into AdWords. Um, smart goals are applicable in a very few circumstances, and most of it is around lead generation and remarketing, finding people that are most engaged in your site and remarketing to bring them back for a lead. Um, e-commerce is different, and smart goals aren't applicable almost all of the time. Um, also, AdWords. You want to be tracking AdWords separately with a separate pixel, um, and it's separate on purpose. It's going to track differently, and it's going to track quicker. So part of the frustration, if you're in uh, a holiday, uh, in holiday, and you're in a segment of e-commerce that is tremendously competitive, if you are having to wait for the analytics pixel to update conversions, it can take between two and four hours. You've lost all of that time to figure out that people are liking your promotion so you can push harder and raise up your position and capture more traffic. Um, AdWords is in real time, and so you want that in holiday. There are some industries in holiday where we will be raising bids on half an hour. Like there's, uh, if you're in the gift basket space, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if you're thinking about going into the gift basket space, don't do it. Um, horribly competitive. Everybody loses money on the first order. They're, they're very brutal to each other. Clicks go from $3 on average up to about $25 on average through holiday season. Uh, conversion rates actually go up to about 25%. So it's brutal. Um, but if you don't have that AdWords pixel, you're going to fall behind all of your competitors regularly. Uh, obviously, make sure it has revenue tracking. Um, and eliminate duplicate orders. So if you look at your conversions tab in AdWords and the repeat rate for the time period you're looking at, usually look at a 30-day window, is over 1.1, you might have tracking problems. Um, it's, it's a, it doesn't happen all the time in big commerce, but we've seen it enough that I need to mention it, that if that number is over 1.1, you could have some duplicate revenue tracking in there, and you could think you're doing a lot better in AdWords than you actually are. So there's some uh, manipulation of the code that can fix that for sure. And so if that has been a problem with you, and I can help you address that on, um, our, on the audit or the hour we have together. Last thing on tracking, keep your AdWords pixel on last click. Google, again, is calling a lot of people lately and trying to convince them to use a time decay model or position-based model for their business. And on e-commerce, you don't need that on your AdWords pixel. Keep it last click. That's what it's been on for years. It keeps your year-over-year -year comparison data true and easy to compare. And you can do all of that uh, attribution modeling within analytics. So you can go into analytics and see what does it look like on time decay? What does it look like on first click? What does it look like on position based? You don't need to have that be the AdWords pixel. So keep it separate and keep it as is so you don't have messed up data year over year and have to do some estimating on how you're, comp how you're comparing. AdWords structure. So this is something that's probably not going to be done right now in the middle of holiday but I wanted you to conceptually understand it because you need to see what you're heading for after holiday. Or if this isn't a big holiday period for you, you can be doing this now. Structuring the TM, non-TM. We talked about it briefly before, but in understanding where your brand terms go and where your non-brand terms go and making sure they stay in their respective buckets on AdWords allows you to uh, shoot for different return on ad spend goals and see if your brand is growing over time and if there are certain non-brand terms that are really good for driving conversions or at least filling the top of the funnel for you. Without that, uh, there are problems. And what I see it happen a lot is companies that have tried to do it, but they didn't use priority settings or negative keyword sculpting in a way that keeps it clean. And so there's a lot of dirty data. And so you can see this by downloading your search query report and seeing if you have uh, brand terms showing up inadvertently in non-brand campaigns. So I see a lot of scenarios like go back to Bob and his bike shop where his non-TM campaign will look really good, let's say on pink bikes. Looks like he's making a lot of money. So he's getting ready to invest in a big purchase of pink bikes because he's it's just doing so well and it's profitable. But if you get into the search query report, he's got a brand, he's got a broad match keyword in there that actually says um, it's capturing somebody looking Bob's bike shop pink bike or uh, Bob's Bike Shop bike tires, and just some broad match keywords have allowed that brand term to come into a non-brand campaign and artificially inflate its return. So it looks it looks better than it should. And so it's important to keep them se segregated. Um, avoid broad match, generally speaking, altogether. Uh, we use modified broad only. It just keeps Google from using a very loose thesaurus when you're structuring things. I also would love for every e-commerce company in shopping to be separating their shopping campaigns on trademark and non-trademark. Um, shopping now can be that way. A lot of companies will have one shopping campaign, all their products in there, and they'll have brand terms going in there. So if you do test searches on Google and you see that Google is showing shopping ads on your brand terms, it opens you up to a lot of your competitors gaining that position on your brand search. And that's never a good thing. Image ads drive a lot of clicks, uh, especially if Google has like nine ads showing on your brand search. Eyeballs are going to shopping, clicks are going to shopping. And so setting your account up to make sure that you are covering all of those shopping ads whenever somebody's using your brand term is highly important. The structure on it and how you do it is right there. It's 
fairly complex, and I don't know uh, with all of you where you're standing in your sophistication of AdWords. So if that's something you're interested in and seeing how it's structured, um, when we do an audit or walk through your account with you, I can show you some of the structuring we've done with some of our accounts and what that would look like for you. So you can actually do that or at some point maybe have us do it. Uh, but can be very valuable. <clears throat> Again, something you want to shoot for. Um, you, may, you could probably do some small tests this holiday season on something like this to see uh, some of the extra levers you would get and get some uh, experience running it. Single product ad groups. It doesn't that matter how, uh, how many products you have, how many SKUs you have, you can have single product ad groups. And there's a lot of benefit to you. We have clients with over half a million SKUs. We put them in single product ad groups. Uh, it gives you a lot of control. Allows you to get a very clean search query report. So this says, right now in shopping, I would venture a guess that most of you have a big bucket of products in one ad group or one product grouping. And then you have a big bucket of search queries. And there's no way at this point to match them up. If you have single product ad groups, you know exactly what is causing that product to show. And you're able to eliminate some searches that are just bad for it um, or figure out some new opportunities you might have that you had never thought of before because you can see how Google is choosing to show your product to searchers. Um, with the right naming convention, you can actually go in um, to Google Analytics and see what people are clicking on and what they're actually buying. This is a, a fairly revolutionary. I don't actually come across a lot of agencies or accounts that actually have figured out how to do this. Uh, but I can show you how and how we've done it and because it gets fairly complex, but the value is tremendous. Most people um, don't uh, realize, I guess, that over 50% of the time when people click on a shopping ad, they actually buy something other than what they click on. If you have fashion, it's even higher. Um, and the more SKUs you have, it's, it's higher, way higher than 50%. Um, and the only way to figure that out is to name it in a way that you can filter it in transactions and analytics and then see what's in the transaction details and see what they actually purchased. So um, <clears throat> the recent study I did on this, the client of ours had about 4,500 uh, SKUs. They had, in a period of time I looked at, I think it was up to a month, I think, we had 732 transactions in shopping for that period of time. We had over 1,900 products purchased in those transactions, so almost three products per, per, per purchase with, from shopping. And of those 732 transactions, only 316 of them, or 43%, had the original product that was clicked on. Hugely surprising to most of our team as we started pushing this data out. Only 16% of that final group of products of 1,900 were the original products clicked. People are using websites to shop. and these platforms like BigCommerce are very good at letting people shop and move through to different products and product suggestions. So once you understand that, it becomes very important to track your data correctly because if you have different product margins across product lines, you need to know that if people are clicking on a high margin product, you're getting excited, but if they're buying a low margin product, you could optimize your account inadvertently into losing lots of money. And so understanding what they're purchasing and their behavior after a click is tremendously important if you want to really scale and grow your online business. When we're talking about this, we have to at least touch on return on ad spend, and at least so that you understand um, how it works, and also being able to tell a story. I have a lot of business owners that are stuck in an old way of doing business that we've had to educate them beyond looking at CPA. You know, a lot of business owners will come in and say, hey, we have to get a, a you know, $15 CPA or we're in, in a terrible spot. And uh, we have to challenge that and say, you know what, you don't care about CPA. It doesn't matter. If, if you're will, Are you willing to pay $100 to get an order if they're spending $5,000 on that order? In most businesses, that's a great deal. Um, and so CPA, who cares if they're buying more expensive products or higher margin products? That's what's important to figure out. So to start that, you have to be able to figure out what your break-even return on ad spend is. Since we have the revenue tracking available to us in AdWords and Analytics, we can set some of these goals. And so if your average margin is 40%, your break-even return on ad spend is 2.5. So over that, you're probably making money. Under that, you're probably investing in new customers. It can be a very positive strategy. And so after we figure out what your break-even ad spend is, we look at a graph like this saying, okay, revenue and return on ad spend. As you spend more and get more revenue, generally speaking, your return on ad spend drops. 
and a lot of uh, business owners and marketing directors I talk to want a high ROAS and they want to get, they're usually stuck in this area of the graph where revenue is low but they get a great return on ad spend. Um, you know, maybe your average profit margin is 0.4 uh, but you need a 7x return on ad spend because uh, we need a lot of profit per order to cover our overhead, to cover our warehouse, to cover all some extra things in the business that may be down. That could be great, but this box here would represent your total profit within this space. And so what may make more sense is actually ending up at a spot similar to this, where you have a lower return on ad spend, but you have a higher volume of orders. And so that's the conversation we like to go through and try to figure out where do we actually, rather than trying to maximize return on ad spend, how do we maximize overall profit to the business? And in many cases, it's increasing volume while decreasing some of the ROAS to capture a bigger piece of the pie. And that can be beneficial to most businesses. Not all. There's, there's circumstances that dictate changes through across every prospect or client I speak with. And in some cases, this actually makes more sense, where you might have the same profit overall as you had with a much lower spend and much lower revenue, but higher return on ad spend. And in this case, you're shooting just for a larger piece of the overall pie. You're buying a lot of customers into your files so that you can email them and bring them back into your brand. So if you have to replace your, your products often or you have a lot of products you can uh, cross sell, this is a, some, a phenomenal space to be, but you have to be able to set your campaigns up in a way to capture that. So that's kind of the uh, future of what you're looking at after holiday. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do a lot of that now, but at least conceptually start those conversations to prepare yourself in the new year to be ready to really step on the gas in some of these areas. At this point in time, you're in holiday. If you haven't analyzed 2016 yet, um, if you've got access to the new AdWords, it's really good for that. So you can see this is one of our clients that we brought on and we helped analyze their 2016 by looking at this general graph on the uh, first page of the new AdWords. The blue line is clicks, the red line is uh, conversions. And so you'll see that uh, search volume or click volume really peaked October 31st. There's a ton of people buying there and his, his business it was a lot of research happening. You have the Black Friday week where you had actually less clicks but super jump of conversions. They had some great promotions for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, did a lot of great stuff. Uh, December 5th was another peak. So it's just kind of the holiday season. People did their research. They're coming back to buy gifts now. Black Friday week is typically I'm buying for myself. December 5th, I'm buying for friends and family. And then you see December 12th week. What happened there? That was the week of Green Monday and uh, Free Shipping Friday. And so I asked him, I was like, okay, so what did you do for Green Monday last year? And he's, his response was, what's Green Monday? Um, that's a problem. And you can see it. Uh, his online sales tumbled. They should have actually been higher than the December 5th one. So he had a huge missing opportunity here. So if you do have a big play in the holiday season, make sure you have something going on Green Monday. You're Even if you don't have a promotion going, people are buying, and you need, you're need you going to have to increase bids a few times that day for sure. And also, free shipping Friday. If you haven't registered for free shipping Friday on the site that says everybody's doing free shipping, do it. Um, it's just expected now, so I don't think registering is as important, but if you don't have free shipping, uh, you might even consider turning your ads off that day because it's just expected. Um, but analyzing this week to figure out where you missed last year, where you're looking this year to op for opportunity at this client, we, we definitely made sure we had some Green Monday things going on. Uh, we actually had some Halloween things going on for them as well to capture all of that search volume and try to get some sales early on in the season. Um, and paying attention to all of the important days. So Halloween, most people don't know that it's actually the fourth largest e-commerce uh, holiday. Uh, you can do a lot of off-brand things that we think get really creative and I think everybody dressed up as a random costume is more inclined to be spending money at work than working at work. So it's just people buy. Uh, for past Veterans Day, obviously, um, there's a lot of promotional things around that. Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Cyber Monday next week. The average shopper spends $400 on Black Friday a huge amount of spend and most of it is buying things for themselves. So that's where TVs become big during Black Friday. Everybody wants those. People go buy movies for themselves at Target. Socks is a big in one of our retailers locally here. So it's really random things, but a lot of money. It gets people really in the buying mode. And then again, don't forget Green Monday, free shipping day. And as you're comparing year over year things, 
make sure you're aligning your dates. That's a big missing I have, especially uh, randomly Cyber Monday will fall in December versus November. And if you are a large enough brand that you're doing, uh, you're doing fiscal months rather than calendar months, these dates can move around on you and you have to be careful when you're comparing uh, month over month, year over year stuff because of, uh, we've had multiple companies that have Cyber Monday fall in, di in different fiscal months that it becomes complicated for marketing budgets. So just be aware of that. Um, so right now, if you don't have a plan for holiday, you want to create a plan for holiday. You've got a couple days before uh, the big chaos starts and conversions really increase dramatically. Um, so if you haven't created a plan, make sure you go back and analyze, use that stuff in the new AdWords. You can still get that same data in old AdWords if you don't have the new one yet. Um, just ensure your budgets are enough. Generally speaking, if you're this far into it um, and you're stuck on static budgets, uh, that can be frustrating, but maybe you can do some budget trading with brand during this next period of time. But also uh, figure 10 to 15% increase in budget, generally speaking, is, is what you're going to need on Google. Um, because of search volume increase, especially if you're in shopping and Google showing more and more shopping ads across uh, searches that they didn't show it on last year, you're going to need that. Have a promo calendar. Know what it is. Have everybody in the organization tying in the same promos, email, search. Uh, social, everybody should have the same promo. And then um, have backup promos. So if you're on Tuesday and sales are lagging, I have some brands that will have two or three promos in their back pocket that they can throw up uh, when sales are slow for the day. And all of those promo things, you need your ads already created. Have your ads created and approved through Google because if you wait until the day of the promo, if you wait till Cyber Monday to get your Cyber Monday text created in AdWords, you're going to be stuck in ad preview purgatory or ad uh, approval purgatory. It, it takes Google a few hours to approve ad text. If you did it the week before, you've already got it to push play and then push pause and enable your other ad text after the fact. So have all of the ad text for the holiday done and in the account, just ready to pause and unpause. And then emergency contacts, it sounds kind of <laughs> Armageddon-like, but what you want is everybody to know who to call or who to touch if something goes wrong or something breaks. So who is your web host? Who's your, who's your email provider? Who's your paid search person? Who's your social person? Um, if something goes wrong, you need to be able to, everybody needs to be able to know who to go to to fix that specific problem um, and having that. So uh, we use SharePoint here for a lot of that. We have, I have a lot of other companies uh, that will use Dropbox that all my partners will be, have access to that. Uh, just to be able to fix problems as they come up and hopefully they don't but I want to be prepared if they do. Also um, you don't need to change any structures or anything within AdWords to be doing remarketing or RLSA which is remarketing list for search ads. So RLSA create those audiences in the audiences tab or your shared library in AdWords and you can apply them to all of your campaigns. You don't have to change the bids but you can get the insight on if it makes sense to change the bids. And so for example um, if you're selling products online and people come to your site and don't buy, does it make sense to bid on that searcher again? I don't know and I won't know until we, you see the data because it's going to be different for all of you. And so we'll see the data and say, okay, this segment of people we saw came back and we click, they clicked on our ad again after they didn't buy the first time. Does that group of people convert at a higher rate or a lower rate? Do I need to adjust my bids based on that? And so some companies, there's a research period that's very condensed, and if they come back within the same day, I want to bid hyper aggressive on them, and I don't want to lose them to a competitor. Um, get that data in there, bid aggressive. Um, so in other cases, it's opposite, where I want to, once you lose them on that first visit, chances of them coming back and buying again are very, very small. And so you bid down on them or eliminate them altogether. DSA, the dynamic search ad, if you've got a lot of products and you don't have an opportunity to build out an extensive campaign right now, use Google's system. Uh, dynamic search ad to have Google build out the ads for you. I usually use it for phishing in all of my accounts at a very, very low bid, usually 10% of my normal search bid, just to see if there's opportunities that Google finds for me where my competitors either A, don't have coverage, so I can get a very cheap click, or B, have very poor quality scores, and I can get that cheap click. And so once you see it, it gives you an opportunity like, hey, I got a conversion off of this search that I had never thought of before. I'm going to build that out and capture all of the market share because my competitors aren't there yet. Uh, it can be a huge advantage in holiday season. Uh, if you're tracking inventory, make sure you're just pausing ads once they go in and out of stock. 
and then this is a uh, one that a lot of companies forget, but you got to pull back once your last shipping day passes. Your bids are highly inflated for a, the competitiveness of holiday. You need to pull them way back after you can't ship anymore. Many times you just flip it off, uh, but usually I pull ads uh, bid down because I don't want to flip them back on after holiday and have them be at the extremely high bids and just be wasting a bunch of money. So pull them back and turn them off uh, during a period of time where you may not be working or you just don't want to be selling uh, or you can't ship. All right, um, last thing, the don'ts. Don't ignore mobile. We know it has an impact. For all of you, it's going to be measured differently, but you need to be aware of it and just don't ignore it and turn it off and assume that we're only going to be printing money on desktop and tablets. Uh, on shopping, don't try to force Google. You might have a wonderful product that you think would be great for this specific search term. If you force Google to show it there, which you can do, it just gets more expensive. And there's a better ways of getting Google to do things by following how their algorithm works rather than trying to blunt force Google into doing something. Um, setting changes. Don't go changing any settings within your AdWords pixel um, or focus on a lot of those. Um, changes within how you're setting ads or just anything that can make comparison very difficult. Once you do it, it's difficult to undo and get clean data to compare and find out what's actually working. Um, and don't set it or forget it. You're going to need to be in your account actively during the holiday season to make it work. Your competitors will be. Um, and, and if you're not, you're going to fall behind. And many times you're going to need to be in the account making bid changes uh, constantly using negative keywords to make sure you're not wasting any money, that your money you are spending on Google is working for your business as hard as possible. And don't give up. There's, I do believe there's opportunity for almost every business. Sometimes it's not on Google, and it's Google not like me saying that, but sometimes it's on social, sometimes it's on other platforms. Bing can be a great place to be playing. Um, we, do, we are one of Bing's top partners, and we want growth partner of the year in North America. Bing has some phenomenal conversion rates, and for certain people, it works a lot better than Google. So um, be aware of it, but it's there. The idea is we want to have one of these, a money printing machine. That's why we got into e-commerce. That's why we have e-commerce companies, so we can have money printing for us while we're not uh, at the office or maybe while we're sleeping, ideally. Uh, okay, so now we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'm, there's no way I'm getting to all of these questions. Uh, so if you have questions I can't get to, please Go to that page that you were on to register. Get an audit with me. I just enjoy the business piece. I enjoy helping companies set the right strategies. So take advantage of it if you can. Um, not everybody gets a chance to get an hour with me to, to talk strategy in their business and look at what they're doing on AdWords. So um, let's see. We do have, again, I am, I am the moderator as well as the presenter, which is unique for me. So bear with me. Um, okay. You have over a thousand products. What's the best way to break them out in single product ad groups? So um, it's not easy. Um, AdWords Editor is a valuable tool. We use a lot of Excel, and um, it's we've had to build some tools in Excel. At the end of the day, that's if you have a lot of products, it can get very difficult. Uh, what I would recommend at this point. Um, there are some tools you can get inside, like a Marin or a Kenshu, if you use those for automated bidding, that can help break some things out. But the tools that they have available were not actually designed for breaking out single product ad groups and shopping. It's just a byproduct that we found accidentally one day, and we actually duplicated it in Excel because we actually don't pay for Marin or Kenshu on our automated bidding. So um, just break it out. Start with uh, your most often sold products and uh, get those in their own ad groups. and uh, start seeing how that uh, allows you to optimize differently. And so usually the high volume things can be where it's most valuable. Um, um, this question, if you don't have non-brand and brand already separated, um, what's new do quick? Well, um, ideally I would actually just create a brand campaign. So the phrase match, um, your brand. So in a very simple way, I've got a small online business that sells some coffee cups. And we take the brand name, we separate it out, put it in phrase match, uh, bid it high because I want to capture anybody searching for that brand. And as I see queries into that brand, I break them out into different ad groups as there's, once there's enough volume to have its own ad group. Um, and I use that phrase match as a negative in my other campaign. So anybody searching for, the, for that, 
and I also add the exact match negative in that uh, other campaign as well. So anybody searching generally for coffee cups, I'm not showing, uh, it's not hitting my brand campaign. So that's on a very small scale how I handle it. So you will have, if you're doing it that way, you'll have a very low volume of searches, probably a low volume of spend around your brand terms, but you, you can ensure that you're showing there. And the goal is twofold. Keep your competitors from showing there, but also give your searchers a better options typically than Google will provide from an organic perspective. Site links are tremendously important. That's something I didn't mention, but came to mind on this question build out expanded site links. So I see a lot of site links in accounts that are just the single lines. You can now have expanded, it's your single line, it's the headline of the site link, and then a bunch of text below it. It, it can make a massive ad and take up tremendous amounts of real estate. Um, you can search Hannah Anderson, it's one of our clients with children's clothing. They'll have usually, if you just do Hannah Anderson, they'll have a giant paid search ad uh, almost every time. And that can be what every one of you can do for your brand terms pretty easily. Uh, I try it for all of our campaigns and whenever Google's gonna show those expanded text ads, I take it because again, it's pushing competitors down. Uh, but those, each one of those site links helps searchers get to the point in the site that they're trying to go anyway. And the less clicks between the searcher and the product they're looking for, the higher the likelihood it will be that they actually convert. The more clicks it takes, the less valuable it is on paid search and the lower your conversion rate is. So if you're seeing low conversion rates on your ad paid search, you might want to consider breaking out your campaigns more granularly uh, and help them go directly to the page that they're looking for. So if they're looking for a pink bike, get them on the pink bike page, not the home page. Um, I see that happen quite a bit. Um, let's see, we've got time for one more question here. I'm scrolling through. Um, uh, here's a general question on ROAS. Um, how to determine if you need to go higher or lower on your return on ad spend goal. Um, again, it's a wonderful it depends question, uh, but more often than not, you're going to find that you need to lower your return on ad spend goal. More often, I mean, because business owners by general want more profit. Uh, I'm one of them. Hey, I, who's gonna turn down more profit? Uh, but what's happening in Google AdWords is if you have limited real estate and Google got rid of four ad positions last year. So we went from 11 paid search positions to seven. There's top and bottom. And so um, with more competition, more people entering the online space, you have to compete for less real estate. And so generally you're gonna have to be able to lower your ad spend requirement or lower your return on ad spend goals because you wanna capture those customers. In turn, you're gonna to have to have a very successful email campaign. If you're selling products that don't get replaced or you don't get repeat business, you might have to get a little more creative. In, in the things you're doing to make sure that you're actually profitable from order one. And so that's some of the things we can talk about if we want to get on an audit with me. But as a general rule, you're probably shooting for too high of an ad spend. Is from all my conversations over the past year and a half, specifically on this question, you're gonna have to shoot lower. Um, thank you again for all the questions, all the opportunities. Um, one more nugget I'll leave you with, go into your account and use the segment button in AdWords and segment top versus other. It'll show you where you have opportunities to improve quality score and capture more volume of traffic without increasing the amount of searches available. You might have a great portion of your searches actually showing below search results in an average position of say 2.5, which normally is good or above the fold, but it can be below the fold and that can be a huge opportunity for you um, where you might think you're capped out on what you're spending. It turns out you can just improve your quality scores, move above the fold, and you can spend two, three, four times as much. Um, again, thank you for your time. Uh, please reach out and do an audit with me. I'd love to help you out and give you some feedback on what you can be doing. Um, all of you get an hour with me. It doesn't cost you anything. I just enjoy it. Again, thank you.